This is a 4 ohm subwoofer and here's what you need to know about ohms before you wire up your subwoofer. Most people that are new to speakers and subwoofers find the whole ohm thing a little bit confusing. If that's you, you're in the right place. You're about to get a quick overview of how speaker resistance works and how to use series and parallel wiring to match your subwoofer to an amplifier. And if you already know how to do that, stick around for a little bit because we're going to bust a few myths later in the video. But if you just want to know how to hook up some subwoofers, here is what you need to know. Every speaker made is going to have a resistance rating and that resistance rating is measured in ohms. If we want to be technically accurate we should call that rating the nominal impedance and not the resistance and that is our first myth. More on that later. This right here is a tower speaker from a home theater setup. This is actually a kit that you can build. I'll give you a link to this kit and everything else that I use in the video down in the video description. This speaker like most home audio speakers has an 8 ohm nominal impedance. This right here is a complete component set designed for car audio use. It's got a tweeter, a mid-range, and a crossover. And you will find that most car speakers like this have a 4 ohm nominal impedance. It's not the case every time. If you drive a Toyota, there's a really good chance your factory speakers have a 2 ohm nominal impedance. And all that's really straightforward. In fact, most people watching probably already knew that. But if you just learned something new, let me know by hitting the like button. But then we move to a subwoofer like this one. Everything descends into chaos because this subwoofer has multiple speaker terminals. What the hell's up with that? If there are multiple sets of terminals, that means the subwoofer has multiple voice coils. The most common configuration is either a single or a dual voice coil. The dual voice coil will have two sets of terminals, but I have seen subwoofers with up to four voice coils. This is a voice coil here. It's literally a coil of wires that sits down into the magnet on your speaker. And the nominal impedance of those voice coils could literally be anything. You commonly see eight ohms for home, four ohms for a car, and then two and one ohm for subwoofers. I've even seen half ohm and JL Audio makes one with 1.5 ohm voice coils. I've even seen Pro Audio speakers with 16 ohm voice coils. And what do you do with all these connections on a speaker like this? Well, I'll show you that in a second, but there's something else that you need to know first. And that is the purpose for all of this voice coil nonsense. Every amplifier also has an impedance rating, but the impedance rating on an amplifier is a bit different. It's a minimum nominal impedance rating. This right here, for example, is a home theater receiver. The manual on this receiver says that it's stable down to four ohms. That means you can wire up all the speakers you want to the speaker outputs, and as long as you don't wire them below a nominal four ohm load, you're very unlikely to damage the amplifier inside the receiver. And that's why all this matters. Your goal is to select speakers and then wire them together so you don't damage your amplifier. Even more important, the lower the impedance, the more power the amplifier will make. In a theoretically perfect world, every time resistance drops by half, the power doubles. And more power means louder music. So if you could take two of these 8 ohm home theater speakers and wire them to 4 ohms on a single channel of the home theater receiver, you can listen to your movies and your music at a higher output level, louder. The trick is to hook it all up correctly, more on that later. This right here is a car audio amplifier. It is a multi-channel amp and each channel is 2 ohm stable, which is fairly standard for most multi-channel car amplifiers. You can bridge most amplifiers like this, which means taking two channels and combining them into one, and that single channel will then be 4 ohm stable. This car audio amp right here is what's known as a monoblock, meaning it has just one channel of output and it's designed for a subwoofer. It is 1 ohm stable, and if you wanted to get 100% of the power available from this amp, you need to wire your speakers to 1 ohm. So how exactly do you do that? Well, there are two ways to wire up components in a circuit. You can wire them in series or parallel. When you connect speakers in parallel, the nominal impedance decreases following this formula right here. And when you connect speakers in series, the nominal impedance increases following this formula right here. And here's another one of those myths. A lot of people refer to these formulas as Ohm's Law. This is not Ohm's Law. These are just formulas for parallel and series resistance. Ohm's Law explains how voltage, current, and resistance are related. I've got videos explaining the math. I'll make sure to give you a link to those videos either up here or down in the video description. And if you don't like math, I've added a calculator to my blog. And here is the blog right here. When you first load the page, it'll show you some wiring diagrams and give you a little bit of background information. But I'm going to scroll down right past all that stuff and get to the important part, which is the actual well, calculator, here it is. It's got a pull down menu where you can select the resistance, the impedance of your voice coil. Let's go with a 4 ohm voice coil. 
Choose the number of voice coils, say it has two, so a dual four ohm voice coil, and then let's wire those in parallel. Then we're going to choose to wire the subwoofers in parallel as well. Hit calculate, and that gives us our result, a one ohm nominal impedance. This is a very common configuration. In fact, it's one of the most common configurations, two dual four ohm subwoofers, everything wired parallel. So you get a one ohm load at the amplifier. Another common configuration is to use a single subwoofer that is a dual two ohm. And since there's only one subwoofer it doesn't matter if we choose parallel or series wiring it's going to give us the same answer either way hit calculate and bam one ohm you can get into a lot of fun scenarios say you had some four ohm subwoofers with multiple voice coils that you wired in series and then you had four of them wired together in parallel hit calculate you get two ohms if you had four subwoofers that were all two ohm voice coils and you wire those voice coils in series and connected the subwoofers themselves in parallel and hit calculate, you get your one ohm load. And you can do this with any scenario you can think of. One caveat, the calculator is not designed to work with mismatched subwoofers. I don't advise that you use mismatched subwoofers, but you can tweak it a little bit. Say for example, hypothetic, you had a pair of subwoofers that had dual two ohm voice coils and then another subwoofer with a single four ohm voice coil. You could wire all those together by first treating those dual voice coil subwoofers as separate units. So you would plug in two ohms, two voice coils in series with just one subwoofer and hit calculate. So if you wire both voice coils of that subwoofer in series, you end up with a four ohm load. And then you can treat each of those four ohm loads as their own independent subwoofer. Take this voice coil resistance and change it to four ohms and choose one voice coil per subwoofer. Well, the wiring configuration won't matter because it'll give you the same result parallel or series. And then connect your three subwoofers in parallel, hit calculate and you get 1.33 ohms. So you can do that to finesse and back out mismatch subwoofers, but again, I don't recommend it. And if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see some more information and some more technical diagrams showing how these are wired up. As you can imagine, there are a million possible combinations of potential ways you could wire up speakers. I don't cover all of them on the blog, but as I have time, I'll upload more diagrams. Now I'm going to break your brain and break some more myths. If you take a multimeter and measure a pair of terminals, you're never going to get the nominal impedance. Here, for example, is a four ohm coil and it's giving me 3.7 ohms. So so what is exactly up with that? If you measure the resistance across the terminals, you get the DC resistance. The nominal impedance is not the same thing as the DC resistance. Here's a shot of a dual two ohm subwoofer. This is a sundown audio subwoofer inside of an enclosure. We get a DC resistance of 1.5 ohms. This is supposed to be a one ohm load at the terminals. So why is it that the nominal impedance is not the same thing as the DC resistance? That's because a speaker is not a DC device. Device. It's an AC device, as in alternating current. DC current can't make music. Most people, when they think about electricity, think in terms of DC. We have a DC mental model in our mind where current flows one direction. In an AC circuit, the current actually moves back and forth. It alternates at some frequency measured in Hertz. You can see that right here on this oscilloscope. What's happening here is that the voltage is swinging between positive and negative values. And that cone moving back and forth rapidly is what makes sound and that makes the music that we hear. If you ran a DC current to a speaker, it would push out and stay out until you broke the circuit. If you flip the polarity, the speaker would pull in. You can see that in this shot right here. I've got the polarity flipped on these two subwoofers and I'm tapping the speaker terminal on the side of the box with a nine volt battery. That's a nine volt DC battery. One cone's moving out, the other one's moving in. This speaker enclosure right here, both speakers are wired with the correct polarity. When I tap the terminal with the battery, positive to positive and negative to negative, the cone moves out. When I flip the polarity on the battery, both cones move in. Another common myth is that speaker cones only move out. That's like an optical illusion. You can see with this nine volt battery test, plain as day, they move in, they move out, and that's going to depend on the direction the current is flowing. If you were to play a 40 hertz test tone through the speaker, it would push out, return to its starting point, and then pull back in before moving back out to the starting point and starting the cycle over again. Each time that happens, we call that one cycle. And with a 40 hertz test tone, that's going to happen 40 times per second. Because a speaker is an AC device, the speaker doesn't do what most people think it does. That's because most people, when they think about electricity, approach it from a DC mental model 
and it turns out that AC current does some really strange and interesting things. So when you think about how a speaker moves and behaves, you need to think about it differently. And as I said earlier, these voice coils that we've been talking about are literal coils of wire. As power passes through the coil, it creates a magnetic field which pushes and pulls against the magnet on the back of the driver. That voice coil is connected to a cone and that action is what makes the cone move. Another name for a coil of wire is an inductor. When you pass AC current through an inductor, the impedance will be a function of the frequency of that AC current, meaning every frequency gets a different resistance. In general, as the frequency increases, the impedance will increase more resistance at higher frequencies. We can do an impedance sweep with a tool like this right here. This is called a DATS, and that will show that process in action. This DATS right here is one of my favorite and most useful tools. If you're really into DIY audio, you probably should get one. And I personally would never have been able to have afforded a tool like this without the direct financial support of my patrons over on Patreon. In addition to behind the scenes content and access to speaker plans, $10 and up patrons get recognized in the video. That's these guys right here scrolling across the bottom. And $25 and up patrons like Jonathan, Joaquin, JD America, Timothy, and Bo get a great big shout out in the video. I literally could not afford to run this YouTube channel without their direct support. If you like this kind of content and want to help support the channel, head over to Patreon and sign up today. If you pay for a whole year up front, you get 10% off at all levels of membership. Okay, back to our impedance sweep, and as you can see, just as I said, as the frequency increases, the impedance going through that coil increases due to the inductance of the coil, and that additional resistance is going to lower the output at those higher frequencies. And here's another really cool feature of any loudspeaker driver. There's a point down lower on the frequency spectrum where that impedance is going to spike. That point is called the free air resonance of the speaker, also known as the resonant frequency. The impedance your amplifier actually sees is going to depend on the music that you're playing and that's going to be constantly changing while the music is playing. That nominal rating is just a tool that you can use to match your speakers to your amplifier and beyond that it means absolutely nothing. Hey look at what happens when I push on the cone. The DC resistance changes. That's because that voice coil is creating a magnetic field. It'll even create voltage when you push on it because that's what happens when you pass a coil through a magnetic field. You create voltage. Hopefully you learn something new. To learn more, click on this playlist right up here. I'm Justin, this is the DIY Audio Guy YouTube channel, and I will see you on the next adventure.